Chapter Eight of the Gold Sickle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gold Sickle by Eugene Sue, translated by Daniel De Leon. Farewell. Agreeable to his promise, Joel pushed off his boat early the next morning, accompanied by his son Albinic the mariner, and took the unknown traveller to the island of Kellor, seeing he did not dare to land at the sacred precincts of the Isle of Sen. The Bren's guest said a few words in a low voice to the Ewog, who mounts perpetual guard in the island's house. He seemed to be struck with respect, and answered that Taliesin, the oldest of the living druids, who then was at the Isle of Sen together with his wife Aurea, expected a traveller since the previous evening. Before leaving Joel, the stranger said to his host, I hope neither you nor your family will forget your resolution of yesterday. This day a call to arms will resound from one end of Breton Gaul to the other. You may rest assured that I and the rest of my tribe will be the first to respond to the call. I believe you. The issue now is whether Gaul shall fall into slavery, or shall rise again to the height of her one-time power and glory. But should I not at this moment, when I am to leave you, know the name of the brave man who sat at my hearth? The name of the wise man who speaks with so much soundness, and loves his country so warmly? Joel, my name shall be Soldier, so long as Gaul is not free, and if we ever meet again, I shall call myself your friend, seeing that I am that. Saying these words, the unknown traveller stepped into the Ewog's boat that was to take him from Kellor to the Isle of Sin. Before the boat, which was under charge of the Ewog, put off, Joel asked the latter whether he would be permitted to wait at the house for his daughter, Hina, who was to come on that day to visit the family. The Ewog informed him that his daughter would not start for the shore until evening. Sorry at not being able to take Hina with him, the Bren re-entered the boat and returned alone with Albinic. Towards noon, Julian went to consult the druids of the forest of Karnak upon whether he should take the immediate and voluntary death which would be a pleasure to him, seeing he was to rejoin Armel, or seek death in battle against the Romans. The druids answered him that having sworn to Armel upon his brotherhood faith, to die with him he should be faithful to his promise, and that the Ewags would bring the body of Armel with the usual ceremonies in order to place it upon the pyre where Julian would find his place at moonrise. Happy at being able so soon to join his friend, Julian was about to leave Karnak when he saw the stranger who had been a guest of Joel, and who now returned from the Isle of Sen, approaching through the forest in the company of Taliesin. The latter said a few words to the other druids, who forthwith surrounded the traveller with great eagerness and marks of respect. The younger ones of the druids received him as a brother, the elder ones as a son. Recognizing Julian, the traveller said to him, As you are to return to the Bren of the tribe, wait a little. I shall give you a letter for him. Julian yielded to the wish of the stranger, who withdrew, accompanied by Taliesin and other druids. He returned shortly, and handed to Julian a little scroll of yellow tanned skin, saying, This is for Joel. This evening, Julian, when the moon rises, we shall see each other again. Hesus loves those who, like you, are brave and faithful in their friendship. Upon arriving at the Bren's house, Julian learned that the former was on the field gathering in the wheat. He went after him, and delivered to Joel the writing sent by the stranger. It said, Friend Joel, in the name of Gaul, now in danger, this is what the Druids expect of you. Command all the members of your family who are at work on the fields to cry out to those of the tribe working not far from them. The mistletoe and the new year. Let every man, woman, and child, all without exception, meet this evening in the forest of Karnak at the rise of the moon. Let those of the tribe who will have heard these words in turn repeat them aloud to those of the other tribes who may also be at work on the fields, so that the call being repeated from mouth to mouth, from one to another, 
from village to village, from town to town, from vans to Ore, notify all the tribes to convene this evening at the forest of Karnak. Joel did as ordered by the stranger in the name of the druids of Karnak. The call was carried from mouth to mouth, from the nearest to the most distant tribes. All were notified to meet that evening in the forest of Karnak when the moon rose. While some of the Brenn's family were hurriedly gathering in the wheat harvest that still remained heaped on the fields in order to deposit a portion of it in cellars that the laborers were digging on dry ground, the women, the girls, and even the children, all working under the direction of Margaret, were as busily engaged disposing of salted meats into baskets, flour into bags, hydromel and wine into pouches. Others were filling coffers with lint and balsam for wounds. Others were adjusting broad and strong tent cloths over the chariots. In all wars considered dangerous, the tribes threatened by the enemy, instead of waiting for, usually went out to meet him. The houses were abandoned, the field oxen were hitched to the war chariots, all of which contained the women, the children, the clothes, and the provisions of the combatants. The horses, ridden by the full-grown men of the tribe, constituted the cavalry. The young men, being more agile, went on foot as an armed escort. The grain was hidden away, the cattle let loose, pastured where they pleased, and returned instinctively every evening to their usual stables. Generally the wolves and bears devoured apart. The fields remained untended, and scarcity followed. Often the combatants who went to war in defense of their country, encouraged by the presence of their wives and children, and having nothing to expect from the enemy but disgrace, slavery, or death, drove back the invader beyond their frontiers, and returned home to repair the disasters of the fields. Knowing that his daughter was due at the house, Joel returned home toward sundown. He also expected to be able to take a hand in the preparations for the war. Hina, the virgin of the Isle of Sen, soon arrived. When her father, mother, and other relatives saw her enter, it seemed to them never before had she been so beautiful. Never before did her father feel so proud of his daughter. The long black tunic that she wore was held around her waist by a brass belt, from which on one side hung a little gold sickle, and on the other a crescent in the shape of the waning moon. Hina had dressed herself with special care in honor of the celebration of her birthday. A necklace and gold bracelets inlaid with garnets ornamented her arms and neck, whiter than the driven snow. When she took off her cape cloak, it was noticed that she wore, as ever at religious ceremonies, a crown of green oak leaves on her blonde hair, plaited in braids over her chaste and mild forehead. The blue of the sea, while lying calmly under a clear sky, was not purer than the blue of Hina's eyes. The Bren stretched out his arms to his daughter. She ran into them joyously, and offered him her forehead, as she also did her mother. The children of the family loved Hina dearly, and contested with each other the privilege of being the first to kiss her hands, sought with greed by all the little innocent mouths, even old Deborah Trud gambled and barked with joy at the arrival of his young mistress. Albinek, the mariner, was the first to whom Hina offered her forehead to kiss after her father and mother. She had not seen her brother for a long time. Next came the turn of Gilhern and Michael, and then the swarm of children, whom, stooping to them, Hina sought to hold all together in one embrace. The young priestess then tenderly greeted Henry, her brother Gilhern's wife, and expressed her regret at not seeing Albinic's wife, Moreau. Nor were the other relatives forgotten all down to Stumpy. Everyone had a kind word from her. The general exchange of greetings being over, and happy at finding herself among her own, in the house where she was born eighteen years before, Hina sat down at her mother's feet, on the same stool that she used to occupy when a child. When she saw her child seated at her feet, Ma'am Margaret called the maid's attention to the disorder that reigned in the house due to the preparations for war, and she said sadly, We should have celebrated this day of your birth with joy and tranquillity, dear child, 
Instead, you now find confusion and alarm in our house that soon will be deserted. War threatens. Mother is right, answered Hena, sighing. Great is the anger of Hesus. And what say you, dear child, you who are a saint, inquired Joel, a saint of the Isle of Sen? What must we do to appease the wrath of the All-Powerful? My mother and father honor me too much by calling me a saint, answered the young virgin. Like the druids, myself and my female companions have meditated all night under the shadows of the sacred oak trees at the hour of moonrise. We search for the simplest and divinest principles and seek to spread them among our fellow beings. We adore the all-powerful in his works, from the mighty oak that is sacred to him down to the humble moss that grows on the rocks of our isle, from the stars whose eternal course we study down to the insect that is born and dies in one day, from the sourceless sea down to the streamlet of water that glides under the grass. We search for the cure of diseases that cause pain, and we glorify those among our fathers and mothers who have shed luster upon Gaul. By the knowledge of the auguries and the study of the past, we seek to foresee the future to the end of enlightening those who are less clear-sighted than ourselves. And finally, like the Druids, we teach childhood. We inspire the child with an ardent love of our common and beloved fatherland, so threatened today by the wrath of Hesus, a wrath that comes down upon them because they have forgotten that they are all the children of the same God, and that a brother must resent the wound inflicted upon his brother. The stranger who was our guest and whom this morning I took to the Isle of Sen, replied the Bren, spoke to us as you do, dear daughter. My father and mother may listen as sacred words to the words of the chief of the Hundred Valleys. Hesus and love for Gaul inspire him. He is brave among the bravest. He? Is he the chief of the Hundred Valleys? exclaimed Joel. He refused to give me his name. Do you know it, daughter? Do you know which is his native province? He was impatiently waited for yesterday evening at the Isle of Sen by the venerable Taliesin. As to his name, all that I am free to say to my father and mother is that the day on which our country should be subjugated will also be the day when the chief of the Hundred Valleys will see the last drop of his blood flow from his veins. May the wrath of Hesus spare us that disastrous day. Oh, my daughter, if Hesus is angry, how are we to appease him? By obeying the law. He has said, All men are the children of one God. By offering to him human sacrifices, may those that are to be offered tonight calm his wrath. The sacrifices of tonight? asked the Bren. Which are they? Do not my father and mother know that tonight? When the moon rises, there will be three human sacrifices at the stones of the forest of Karnak. We know, answered Joel, that all the tribes have been convened to appear this evening at the forest of Karnak. But who are the people that are to be sacrificed and will be pleasing to Hesus, dear daughter? First of all, Daolus the murderer. He killed Hoarn without a fight and in his sleep. The druids have sentenced him to die this evening. The blood of a cowardly murderer is an expiation agreeable to Hesus. And the second sacrifice? Our relative Julian wishes out of friendship to rejoin Armel, whom he loyally killed in a contest. This evening, glorified by the chant of the bards, he will go, agreeable to his vow, and join Armel in the unknown worlds. The blood of a brave man voluntarily offered to Hesus is agreeable to him. And the third sacrifice, dear child, asked Mam Margaret, who is it? Hina did not answer. She dropped her blonde and charming head upon the knees of Margaret, remained a while in a reverie, kissed her mother's hands, and said to her with a sweet smile that brought back old remembrances. How often did not little Hina, when still a child, fall asleep of an evening on your knees, mother, while you spun at your distaff, and when all of you now present except Albinic, were gathered at the hearth, narrating the virile virtues of our mothers and our fathers of old. It is true, dear daughter, answered Margaret, caressingly passing her hand over the blonde hair of her child. It is true. 
and here among us we all loved you so much for your good heart and your infantine grace that when we saw you had fallen asleep on my knees we all spoke in a low voice not to awake you stumpy who was among the crowd of relatives put in but who is the third human sacrifice that is to appease hesus and deliver us from war who hena is the third to be sacrificed this evening i shall tell you stumpy when i shall have had a little time to meditate upon the past answered the young maid dreamily without leaving her mother's knees and passing her hand over her forehead as if to refresh in her memory she looked around pointed to the stone where stood the copper bowl with the seven twigs of mistletoe and proceeded saying when i was twelve do my father and mother remember how happy i was at having been selected by the female druids of the isle of sen to receive in a veil of linen whitened in the dew of night the mistletoe which the druids cut with a gold sickle at the moment when the moon shed its clearest light do my father and mother remember how bringing home the mistletoe to sanctify our home i was taken hither by the ewags in a chariot decked with flowers and greens while the bards sang the glory of hesus what tender embraces did not my whole family lavish upon me at my return what a feast it was in our tribe dear dear daughter said margaret pressing hena's head against her maternal breast if the female druids chose you to receive the sacred mistletoe in a linen veil it was because your soul was as pure as the veil it was because little hena was the bravest of all her companions she almost perished in the attempt to save janid the daughter of war who as she was gathering shells on the rocks along the shore of glenheck fell into the water and was being carried away by the waves said michael the armorer tenderly contemplating his sister it was because beyond all others little hena was sweet patient and kind to the children it was because when only twelve she instructed them like a matron at the cottage of the female druids of the isle of sen said gilhern in his turn the daughter of joel blushed with modesty at the words of her mother and brothers but stumpy insisted but who is the third human sacrifice that is to appease hesus and deliver us from war who is it hena who is it to be sacrificed this evening i shall tell you stumpy answered the young maid rising i shall tell you after i have once more looked at the dear little chamber where i used to sleep when having grown unto maidenhood i came here from the isle of sen to attend our family feasts and stepping towards the door of the chamber she stopped for a moment at the threshold and said what sweet nights have i spent there after retiring for the evening regretful of leaving you with what impatience did i not rise in the morning to meet you again taking two steps into the little chamber while her family felt ever more astonished at hearing hena still so young thus dwell upon the past the young maid proceeded taking up several articles that lay upon the little table this is the seashell necklace that i entertain myself making in the evening sitting besides my mother and these are the little dry twigs that resemble trees that i gathered from our rocks this is the net which i used when the tide was going out to catch little fishes with how the sport used to amuse me and there are the rolls of white skin on which every time i came here i recorded my joy at meeting my relatives and again seeing the house of my birth i find everything in its place i am glad at having gathered these young girls treasures stumpy however whom these little mementos did not seem to affect again repeated in his sour and impatient voice but who is to be the third human sacrifice that is to appease hesus and deliver us from war who hena is to be sacrificed this evening i shall let you know stumpy answered hena smiling i shall let you know after i have distributed my little treasures among you all you among them stumpy saying this the daughter of the bren motioned to her relatives to enter the chamber and in the midst of the silent astonishment of all she gave a souvenir to each each even of the little ones who loved her so much and also stumpy received something in order to make her gifts reach around she loosened the seashell necklace and split up the dry twigs saying in her sweet voice to each keep this i pray you out of friendship for hena your relative and friend joel his wife and his three children to all of whom hena had not yet given aught looked at one another all the more astonished at what she did 
seeing that toward the end tears appeared in her eyes, although the young maid gave no other token of sadness. When all the others were supplied, Hena took from her neck the garnet necklace that she wore, and said to Margaret, while kissing her hand, Hena prays her mother to keep this out of love for her. She then took the little rolls of white skin that had been prepared for writing on, handed them to Joel, and kissing his hand, said, Hena prays her father to keep this roll out of love for her. He will there find her most cherished thoughts. Detaching thereupon from her arm her two garnet bracelets, Hena said to the wife of her brother Gilhern, the laborer, Hena prays her sister Henry to wear this bracelet out of love for her. And giving the other bracelet to her brother, the mariner, she said, Your wife Moreau, whom I love as much for her courage as for her noble heart, is to keep this bracelet as a souvenir from me. Hena then took from her copper belt the little gold sickle and crescent that hung from it. She tendered the former to Gilhern the laborer, the second to Albinic the mariner, and taking a ring from her finger, she gave it to Michael the armorer, saying to the three, I wish my brothers to preserve these keepsakes out of love for their sister, Hena. All those present remained astonished and holding in their hands the gifts that the Virgin of the Isle of Sen had delivered to them. They all remained standing and so speechless with astonishment that none could utter a word, but looked uneasily at one another as if threatened by some unknown disaster. Hena finally turned to Stumpy. Stumpy, said she, I shall now let you know who it is to be the third sacrifice of this evening. And taking the hands of Joel and Margaret, she gently led them back into the large hall, whither all the others followed. Arrived there, Hena addressed her parents and assembled relatives. My father and mother know that the blood of a cowardly murderer is an expiatory offering to Hesus, and that it might appease him. Yes, you told us so, dear daughter. They also know that the blood of a brave man who dies in a pledge of friendship is a valorous offering to Hesus, and that it might appease him. Yes, you told us so, dear daughter. And finally, my father and mother know that the most acceptable of all offerings to Hesus, and most likely to appease him, is the innocent blood of a virgin, happy and proud at the thought of offering her blood to Hesus, and of doing so voluntarily, voluntarily, in the hope that that all-powerful God may deliver our beloved fatherland, this dear and sacred fatherland of our fathers, from foreign oppression. Thus the innocent blood of a virgin will flow this evening to appease the wrath of Hesus. And her name, asked Stumpy, the name of that virgin who is to deliver us from war, Hena looked towards her father and mother with tenderness and serenity, and said, The virgin who is to die is one of the nine female druids of the Isle of Sen. Her name is Hena. She is the daughter of Margaret and Joel, the Bren of the tribe of Karnak. Deep silence fell upon the family of Joel. None, not one present, expected to see Hena travel so soon yonder. None, not one present, neither her father nor her mother nor her brothers nor any of her other relatives was prepared for the farewells of the sudden journey the children joined their little hands and said weeping what leave us so soon our hina why do you journey away the father and mother looked at each other and sighed margaret said to hina joel and margaret believed that they would have to wait for their dear daughter in those unknown worlds where we continue to live and where we meet again those whom we have loved here. But it is to be otherwise. It is Hina who will precede us. And perhaps, said the Bren, our sweet and dear daughter will not long have to wait for us. May her blood, innocent and pure as a lamb's, appease the wrath of Hesus, added Margaret. May we soon be able to follow our dear daughter, and inform her that Gaul is delivered from the stranger and the remembrance of the valiant sacrifice of our daughter shall be kept alive in our race said the father so long as the descendants of joel the bren of the tribe of karnak shall live they will be proud to number among their ancestors hena the virgin of the isle of sen the young maid made no answer 
her eyes wandered with sweet avidity from one relative to the other as at the moment of undertaking a journey the departing one takes a last look at the beloved beings from whom he is to be separated for a while pointing through the open door at the moon that now at her fullest was seen across the evening mist rising large orbed and ruddy like a burning disk stumpy cried hina hina the moon is rising above the horizon you are right stumpy this is the hour she said unwillingly taking her eyes from the faces of her beloved family an instant later she added let my father and mother and all the members of my family accompany me to the sacred stones of the forest of karnak the hour of the sacrifice has come walking between joel and margarid and followed by all the members of the tribe hena walked serenely to the forest of karnak end of chapter 8